welcome to another episode of Fully Charged. Uh, this week coming from Horsham in Sussex. Lovely rolling countryside of Sussex, but in fact we're in this amazing fabrication plant which belongs to a company called Ceres Power. Now, what does Ceres Power do, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They make fuel cells. Now, did you notice how I said that? I didn't say hydrogen fuel cells, I just said fuel cells. What they make here is world-leading, literally the global leader in the field. There's people coming here from all over the world, from China, from Japan, from America, to look at what's happening in Horsham in Sussex. And so I'm going to have a look now, and to do that, I need to put on a special hat that's very exciting. How do I look? <laughs> Phil, thank you very much for uh, giving us some time today. Can you just go through the real rudiments for a thicko like me? You make fuel cells. So, very simply, it's almost like a continuous battery. If you give it fuel, it gives you power, but it's doing it incredibly efficiently. I naturally think of sort of gas. You get gas and you burn it and you yeah. produce heat, but you're not burning anything. No, we're not. This is an electrochemical process and that's what makes it highly efficient. In fact, we can generate power at the, at the point of use. So in your home or in your business, it's more efficient than the grid. Right. So the fuel cells we've got here generate power from gas in to power out at more than 50% electrical efficiency. If you think about the, our grid in the UK, it's about 35% efficiency because we waste a lot of energy through cooling towers, through uh, transmission, distribution, yeah. etc. A lot of the fuel cells that we're seeing in installations today in things like data centers in the US, uh, in homes in Japan, uh, starting to get into offices and buildings run on conventional fuels. And the kind of technology we have here at Ceres runs on everything from natural gas to biofuels to hydrogen. So we're totally fuel flexible. You could have the same, literally the same machine could run on all those three. Yeah, that, that's correct. You might make some slight adjustments to the system, but essentially the cell can, can deal with all those. A lot of people might say, well, that's not zero carbon, but it has a hell of a lot of benefits because it's low carbon. Like in a home application, you're saving about a third of your energy and therefore you're saving about 30% of your CO2. And also, with this kind of technology, your zero emissions, your zero SOX, your zero NOx, and your zero particulates. If you did have a supply of, of hydrogen from splitting water from yep. excess renewables, can you put just hydrogen into the system that you're yeah, running and it'll absolutely. still run? I mean, I mean the, the, the cells we're making here, we test on hydrogen. Right. So we could yeah. run on everything from 100% gas to uh, 10 percent hydrogen in the gas grid, right. 50 percent, all the way through to 100 percent hydrogen. I see. So it's a brilliant bridging yeah. technology. I mean, you can, we can use that, that infrastructure while it's functioning, while other things develop. Yeah. We're, we're dealing with a lot of companies who are looking at alternatives to conventional combustion engines and, and diesel engines. Yeah. And a big drive for this technology now is, is air quality issues. And what we do at Ceres is we make the core fuel cell, the steel cell, but we embed it, a bit like an Intel inside, we embed it in the future uh, power systems of these global companies. So you can use this to power a data center, you can use it as a range extender for electric vehicle, you could use it to power your home, or you could use it to power a business. The technology originally came from a, a guy in Imperial College over 15 years ago, a guy called Professor Brian Steele. What he did, which is really clever, is he took steel and managed to make a fuel cell, which is over 90% steel with a very thin layer of ceramic to do the function of the fuel cell printed on top. And that's essentially the steel cell that we have today. It seems to be one of the things that we're holding back sort of mass adoption of fuel cells is the cost of the materials yeah. in it. So what are the materials that you're using here very expensive? It's a combination of using low cost steel. We don't use precious metals. We don't use platinum. Right. Things like There's that no in the precious fuel cell. metals at all. So we use a, a conventional ceramic, which is used in self-cleaning ovens, etc. But then we're producing it on equipment, which is adapted from the solar PV industry. It's a combination of available materials and available, conventional manufacturing. Available technology yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah. Right. If, we were, if we were in Japan, you would have adverts for this on TV now, right. and you could buy one in your local gas showroom. Yeah. And they've uh, sold about 150,000 of these things already, wow. and they, they have a target of a million installed by 2020, and five million by 2030. Wow. And just to get that in context, that's the equivalent of a Hinkley point, but faster and cheaper yeah. than we'll ever see Hinkley come online yes. probably. Yeah. Germany is now following suit. So the German government are offering um, good incentives for, for fuel cells there. And that's really about balancing 
renewables with distributed generation. Yeah. So what this technology does is it enables more renewables onto the system because it can deal with the uh, peaks and yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you had a technology that would enable you to generate the power in your home at the point where, you, the need point it, where you need it, you'd have it. Yeah. And th that's what this technology does. So the conventional generation is being disrupted. I mean, yeah. my view is in the future, you've got, you've got solar, you've got batteries, you've got electric vehicles, and you'd have fuel cells. Yeah. And all these parts of the energy system would work in a very complementary fashion. Right. I mean, it's an impressive setup you've got in here, yeah. but it is, I can tell, it's still on a relatively small scale. So this could be in a, you could have a gigafactory. Yes. <laughs> this is our first step towards a gigafactory. Yeah. It's the mega factory. This is just a gig yeah. factory. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what it is is the key steps in actually how we right. make a steel cell. It's basically a combination of, as you can see here, steel with ceramics printed on the top. Right. We make it porous by laser drilling hundreds of thousands of tiny holes and that makes a conventional sheet of steel porous and then we print the, the layers of the anode, the electrolyte, the cathode on top right. and fire that and that's what makes wow. a steel cell. Normally, when you fire ceramic on steel, you will destroy the steel. And that's the clever uh, right. IP that came out from Professor Brian Steele. But what is mind-boggling is that that is actually perforated steel, because it looks like a smooth sheet of steel. If you look at it from an angle, I can see yeah. that the middle bit is sort of matte. Yeah, that's but right. that is holes that go right through it, so yeah, it's yeah. not just a, a dint in it, it's no. a hole right through. So what is going through those holes when it's operating? So you're putting fuel on one side, uh, which is natural gas, and then that's getting converted into hydrogen and O2 minus ions, air on the other side. And basically, the electrolyte allows ions to go through, but electrons can't, and they go around the outside, and that creates the, the voltage, the circuit. Right. Right. And one of those cells there is enough to power uh, a light bulb. And then wow. what you do is you stack them up, so about 100 cells is what you would need to power your house. Right. In terms of watts, then, what would a hundred produce? Is about a kilowatt. About a kilowatt, yes. right. So yeah. it's enough to run a house. Yeah, base load. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look through at the unit on the wall. All right. In the utility room. Yeah, so, wow. so essentially it hooks in just like a boiler does. You've got a gas feed, you've got connections to your heating circuit, uh, you've got a flute in the outside world. Um, but the electricity comes out of the three wires instead of instead of going in. Instead of going in, God, that is amazing. It so, feels very warm in here, and there is yes, there's some. It's yeah, not hot, it's, but there's some warmth coming. There's off. about a, I think something like 100 watts of heat coming off the sides, right. and that's that's just the trade between how much insulation you want to put in, how big you want to make it, and right. how much heat comes off. So what you've basically got then is a is a, a fuel cell that's gen, uh, generating electricity. Yeah. Where, and I'm presuming that's telling us how much 700 watts. Yeah, 700 watts. So it's running right. steady state because it's the winter, so heat's always useful. So right. it just runs it flat out. But then that's running. So that's heating your what your hot water and your central heating as well or is it helping that yeah it's kind of it's running i suppose in parallel with the boiler so right. it's topping up the hot water tank when you haven't got a call for heat and then when right. you have got a call for heat it's it's, it's helping supply that warm. yeah so actually i've had a smart meter installed here so that i can actually show you oh. kind of month by month very good oh let's have a look at that ah a graph that's yeah. what i like i need to see a graph so this is from my uh, smart meter um, right. So it's showing the last year's electrical data. I think it's fair to say it's made quite a big difference to your electricity consumption from the grid. Yeah, it's <laughs> like <actually>, massive. <laughs> yeah, so I think oh, it's 70, 75 percent of my electricity now comes from, from that from the fuel cell. Right. Um, the rest comes from the grid, and, right. and I'm actually making slightly more than that. So some of it gets, gets exported to the grid as well. Right. So is there a feed-in tariff like there was originally with solar panels? Right? There is a feed-in tariff. Um, right. The government's just uh, announced they're going to keep that going for a bit longer. Um, right. So there is feed-in tariff for. Mark for Combined heating power systems. Right. So that's the Which kind of environmental is. carbon win is that you're you're using uh, you're generating both electricity and heat at the same time. Right. So I think I mean the finances of it. Um, very simply, if you if you buy gas for well, I don't know three and a half p or whatever your gas price is, you convert that to electricity at roughly fifty percent efficiency. Right. So it's costing about seven p to make a, a unit of electricity, make seven or eight p. Right. But it's essentially just making electricity in this way because it's more efficient saves you money. Yeah. Um, all the waste heat you're also capturing into your, into your hot water, yes. so you're using less gas for that. So right. if you right. add a feed-in tariff on top of that, then That's it's, added it's, added much, it's probably a kilowatt in, half a kilowatt, 500 watts of electricity, and maybe 350 watts of heat. Right. 
So, I mean, is it, is it more efficient than having gas burning in a flame that heats water? Electricity and heat is the, is the equation. If you just look yeah. at use of gas, a boiler is a very, very good way of turning gas into heat. Right. Um, but then you're buying your electricity from somewhere else and throwing away heat. So yeah. the thing to do is bring the two together and do it in one place. Yeah. So as an overall package, it's, it's uh, one of our customers described it, it's, it's the best use of gas. The other one is that you're making electricity where it's needed. So yeah. you're also trying to electrify vehicles. Uh, you're also trying to electrify central heating. So that needs a lot more electricity distributed around the network as well. Right. So making electricity distributed around the network uh, is a big win for the energy yeah. system as a whole. Um, so it is. I think there's going to be a lot more kind of discussion about the whole energy system rather than one technology. Yes. You know, automotive and utilities are going to have to start talking to each other. And it's, yeah. it's a very different kind of world we're yeah. moving into energy-wise. Well, that's all we've got time for for this episode of Fully Charged. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating day. I've learned so much about fuel cells and their future implementation into the power matrix. Yeah, there we go. There's a bit of technical talk for you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and Phil from Series Power for looking after us so well. They bought us sandwiches. I'm just being transparent. And uh, please uh, subscribe to Fully Charged and have a look at the Patreon link if you've got time and you, you would like to support this show. That's what makes it possible to do. And as always, as I always say at the end of a show, if you have been, thank you for watching. <laughs>